Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, we want to come before you and praise you for your grace. We thank you for being a God who saves wretched sinners, who forgives us, who is a God that pours out grace and mercy on us continually. Lord, I thank you for repentance, Father, and I thank you for salvation that you've provided us through Christ on the cross, and I thank you for this word that you've given us. I pray as we finish out this book, as we come to the conclusion of this letter, that you would be in our hearts, that you would teach us how we should live a Christ-like life, and that we would be always reliant upon you, Father, to do that, that we would not trust ourselves to build some kind of moralism in our own spirit, in our own body, but that we would rely on you and trust you, and seek you daily to accomplish this. Father, I pray for those that are away from us, those that are sick. We know there are those that are still suffering all many physical ailments, and I pray you'd be with each and every one of them, that you would heal their bodies and be with them and comfort them. Lord, I want to pray that you would be with us as we look at this text, and that your words will be the words that I speak, and that your words will be the ones that we learn today and we understand from your word. And I pray this in Christ's most holy and precious name. Amen. Two more times. We'll do this sermon and one more, and we will be finished with the book of Colossians. So this this sermon and next week will be our conclusion of the book in its entirety. Uh, I've selected and decided that after Colossians, we're going to do the gospel of Matthew. That's what we're going to do. That's the determination there. And, you know, I thought it was funny because I... Asked everybody what they wanted to do, and you say, Alex, you wanted all this input. You asked uh, what books, and you did nothing. You did none of the ones that anyone uh, wanted done, and there's a reason for that, and I promise I'm going to get to that. It's because Matthew is a lot longer than Colossians. It's going to, so me and April did the math, so if it takes me a year to do Colossians, it's going to be, what, four or five years, maybe, if I get through Matthew. So there will be a lot of um, interspersion of other material. That's the plan. So I might take a break from this and maybe do a little bit in Genesis. There were some suggestions for Genesis. There were some suggestions for James. Might do a little bit of that um, as we get into the Gospel of Matthew here in the coming weeks. So we'll get to there. But to finish up this particular book, I wanted to at least let you guys know what's going on with that. But moving forward, we're right here in chapter 4, verse 9. Verse 9, in the middle of these closing greetings of the work of Colossians here, last week uh, we looked at all of these examples and how really this entire text, 7 down through 18, is one demonstration of how the body works together, how no one man is able to work together for the purpose of the gospel and the ministry. In the final analysis, we need to function together as a body to accomplish the will of of the Father. And all these people, all these names, all these examples are demonstrations of that. So really, looking at all these individuals here is going to be a uh, series really on the examples that they set. These are models that we are to follow. As last week, we looked at Tychicus as our uh, example, if you will, in verses 7 and 8, that he is that demonstration. He's a positive demonstration of how the body's supposed to work. He supports Paul. He maintains Paul. He helps sustain Paul in his ministry, and he encourages the hearts of his brothers and sisters in Christ. And uh, this week, we're going to look at a couple of these other individuals and how we are to follow in their examples, how they also model Christ to us in these, uh, in these different ways and in these different actions that they take. And uh, in Tychicus's case, in verses 7 and 8, that he brings encouragement and he brings support to the Colossian church by letting them know of the work of God that is being done by Paul and also by supporting Paul in his ministry. Simply uh, being that encouragement, simply being that uh, information to the other part of the body that, hey, God is at work in Rome, that kind of demonstration that Tychicus shows. And in that way, Paul praises him. He praises Tychicus for being faithful as a faithful minister, uh, a minister of the word of God, that he's a beloved brother, all these things that describe him. And uh, when dealing with the rest of this passage, I'm going to be brushing by several of these names very quickly. I want to focus centrally on verses 12 and 13, which deal with Epaphras. Epaphras is a character that, uh, for those that were with us in the beginning of the uh, series, might be familiar with. We're going to look at him in more so detail. But before we get to Epaphras, there's a couple other names that are worth mentioning. None of these particular names that we're about to go through all the way down to Epaphras 
necessarily have uh, one incredible message in and of themselves that they're preaching to us in this day and age. Not every one of them is going to do that. But we can understand their examples as they're presented here in this text. For example, in verse 9, you have one figure that we're already fairly familiar with, the example of Onesimus. Onesimus is here. I'm going to read verse 9. So it says, and with him, so with Tychicus, I'm also sending, is implied, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother who is one of you. And they will tell you everything also that has taken place here. So it's worth mentioning that this Onesimus character shows up again, and uh, Paul describes him similarly to Tychicus, right? So we see here that Tychicus is going to the Colossians. He's the one uh, bringing the message to the Colossians, and Onesimus is going with him. Onesimus is that figure that we know of as the book of Philemon. He is the subject of the entirety of the letter of Philemon. And uh, he describes him both also as these particular characteristics that describe Tychicus. He's a faithful minister. and He's a beloved brother. Both of these are also applied to Onesimus in verse 9. And we remember from last week that we're to follow those examples, right? We want to model Tychicus. Much of uh, the Old Testament, and in fact the New Testament, was written in a narrative format so that we can see the stories of people that did live godly lives in, the, in both demonstrations in both covenants, and that we are, they are set there for our example, Paul says in other literature, that we are to follow their model. And here's another example of someone to model, someone who is a godly man, someone who demonstrates faithfulness and also is a beloved brother. We have to emulate those examples if we're going to be seeking to live a Christ-like life. But specifically, there's an interesting story behind Onesimus that is not described here in this book, but... If we understand what happens in Philemon, we realize there's a lot going on here that's not necessarily laid out in the book of Colossians. For example, if you wish to, we can look at Philemon, uh, verse 10 through 12. It has no chapters. It's a very small book. Uh, but just for reference, this is what we remember about Onesimus. So I'm just going to read verses 10 through 12 of Philemon. He says, Paul says, I appeal to you for my child. He's appealing to Philemon. For my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. And I'm sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. So we know here there's some backstory behind Winnesimus. Here's essentially what happens. If you read the letter of Philemon, this is basically what goes down. Winnesimus was a slave of Philemon. He was Philemon's property. And um, he was not saved. He was not repentant. He was just pagan is as pagan does, and he ran away. He ran away from his master. Uh, something cap it was a capital offense in the Roman Empire. It was a big deal. He ran away from his master. He ran to Rome. That's where he sought to escape from. At some point, he ran into Paul. Uh, we're not sure how that happened, but at some point, he became saved by the gospel, by the close ministry that was happening there by Paul. He becomes saved. He repents of his sin. He puts his faith in Christ which is an amazing thing, but then he realizes that he now has to reckon with his past action. He has to deal with his problem. He has to deal with the fact that he's a runaway slave. It's interesting also to realize in the context here, again, this is, since this is a capital offense, and here he is required to return to his master biblically, that, that's the right thing to do, to return to Philemon and make it good. That could have got him killed. He could have, Philemon, if he was in an ungracious mood or if he was a pagan by any means, could have said, chop his head off and could have done it and been rightfully okay with doing it. Onesimus is going out on a limb. If he gets found out, if he gets discovered that he's a runaway slave, his head could be on a pike. So the fact that he's willing to blow his cover and go back to Philemon and say, I'm the runaway slave and I'm here to return, that's risky for Onesimus. So that's the backstory of what we understand about this slave. It's also, uh, just as a textual note, as a historical note, it's pretty clear in both this letter and the letter of Philemon that uh, Onesimus and Philemon and the events that transpire in Philemon were pretty geographically close to Colossae because here you see Onesimus is going back to that region. Onesimus accompanies Tychicus back to this region. Also, there's a couple names that are mentioned here that I'm going to look at here in a minute that only otherwise appear in Philemon. So, it implies heavily that Onesimus and Philemon are in from that area, they're close by, and this journey, Onesimus is returning back to his master in this particular demonstration. He's going back with Tychicus to make it good. 
Now, you can see a little more evidence for that, that both of these people live very close to one another. Uh, you can see that just as a textual note. In Colossians 4, 17, at the very, almost at the end of the book, you see the name Archippus. That name only appears one other place, and that's in Philemon uh, 1 through 3. So, another more evidence that is lumped together with this idea that both of them were together in the same area. So, you have two guys here. You have Tychicus, who's returning to encourage the hearts of the Colossians. You have Onesimus, who's going back to Colossae to make something right, to fix something, to make it good with his master. He has to redeem himself, so to speak. And then you have a couple other names that are mentioned. I'm going to keep moving fairly quickly through these. Verse 10, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you. And Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions, if he comes to you, welcome him, and Jesus, who is called Justice. These are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. Now, there are some of these individuals we just simply, this is one of those guys we just don't have any information on, Aristarchus. We have very little to speak of in his regard. He's mentioned only, only very, very briefly in the entire text of the New Testament. However, we do recognize these other names. We recognize Mark and Barnabas, clearly, don't we? Mark, obviously, this is the writer of Mark, of the Gospel of Mark, who is the cousin also of Barnabas. And while this seems like a simple greeting in passing, this seems like just simply, by the way, these guys say hi, they're signing the postcard, they're adding their signature at the bottom of the letter saying, we were here, and that is true, that is what they are doing, but there's another deeper story that's going on, again, with these figures that is worth understanding to understand Scripture as a whole, especially the book of Acts. So, what is interesting here is that there is some small backstory between Paul and Mark and Barnabas, and if nothing else, this passage here, the fact that Paul says, they're with me, and I want you to welcome them and greet them in the name of the Lord, that is actually a reminder of forgiveness and grace. And I want to demonstrate that. I'm going to explain that as I go through that. That for Paul is forgiving them. Paul is making something good with Mark and Barnabas in this regard. And for that reason, I'm going to show you that. Let's go to Acts 15. Acts 15, 36 and 40. Because those who may know their Acts history may know that uh, Paul and Barnabas didn't necessarily part on really good terms. Acts 15, verse 36 and 40 says this. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of God and see how they are. So here's Paul. He's been on a missionary journey. He's gone through all these cities, and he says, I want to go back and do some review. I want to hit all those cities again, see how everybody's doing. And Barnabas says, okay, but he says, I want to take Mark with me. Now, this is where there's another, even another layer of confusion. Now, Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark. Mark is the surname. So the Gospel of Nar Mark excuse me, is actually named after his surname. Um, I believe it was his first name was John, or it was his surname, but whatever the case may be, he had two names, John and Mark. And this is different from the writer of the Gospel of John. This is a different John. So you have John, the Gospel writer, and then you have Mark, who also was named John. So just to add just another layer of confusion into the midst of this. But then he says, so I want to bring Mark with me. But Paul best thought it or thought it best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. And Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. So they didn't end on a great note. Barnabas didn't and Mark and Barnabas. And you can see even this premise is shown in Acts 13.13. 13. If you turn back a couple pages, in Acts 13, verse 13, you'll see where Paul said, Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia, and there John left them and returned to Jerusalem. Not the Gospel of John writer, but John who is called Mark. So, apparently at some point, what happened was, there was some point, for whatever reason, that's never described in Scripture, Mark left. He went home. He had to leave. He did not stay with the ministry for whatever reason. And for, that affected Paul's determination. That affected Paul's judgment of Mark. That affected what Paul determined Mark should do. So he says now, later in Acts 15, I don't want to bring him with me. We don't know how it went down. We don't know exactly why or what happened or what was the reason for that. But for whatever reason, Paul determined it was not a wise move. Barnabas didn't like that. 
So they parted on not good terms. They didn't part well. It's, almost, it's also kind of interesting how after Acts 15, Barnabas really kind of falls out of the picture. He's mentioned in passing, like you see here in Colossians and at the end of a couple other letters, but really Barnabas kind of disappears after this. We don't know exactly what went down with that. But they had some sort of disagreement as to whether or not Mark should be included on a particular revisiting journey. And while we don't know what the nature of that was, it was clearly enough that it was something to part ways over. This is uh, an interesting statement. This is an interesting story, if nothing else, than to uh, also preach briefly on the fact that there are those that kind of hold the, Acts, uh, the early church and the Acts church up as the perfect church, as it is the model church. And it is the model that we follow. Don't get me wrong. We want to be like the church that the apostles built and the apostles were. But it was not perfect by any means. They had disagreements and they fought to the point where they parted ways. The apostles on some cases, or those immediately close to the apostles. So we can bear that in mind. Nothing has changed <laughs> in our modern day, just like then and now. But as we can see here in this letter, that does not necessarily, and by definition cannot mean, that there was some kind of ill will there, that there was some kind of strife between them, that there was disagreement to them still, because here Paul states that they are to welcome Barnabas, and he is with them now, as a sign of forgiveness and grace. So, remember, he's reading this, and when we read this, it says that he's here with me. They greet you, Aristarchus greets you, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. So they're with him currently in Rome. They're with him right now, and they're greeting the Colossians. And to that end, he also says, welcome them. So, if nothing else, this is a reminder of the principle of forgiveness. This is a reminder of grace. This is a reminder of resolution between Christian brothers. They've they resolved it. They were forgave one another. There was grace. They made it good. So, and then finally, this last guy who's mentioned here. And Jesus, who is called Justice. These are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God. Last point that I want to make before I get to Epaphras is this statement about this guy named Justice. Obviously, this is not Jesus, Jesus Christ. This is a man who just happened to have the same name as Jesus, just as uh, in Hebrew and Aramaic. Uh, that Jesus' name is rendered Yeshua. That's his name in Hebrew. In Greek and Roman, or especially in Latin, it was Justice. That's how they rendered the name of Jesus in Latin. Justice is his name, if you translate it into Latin. So this guy happened to have the same name. And there's another small reminder here that Paul himself includes in the text. And he says, these are the only men that were circumcised that are workers for the kingdom of God. And that comforts me. This is another reminder of what we preached on last week, which was that Paul can't do it by himself. Paul personally is unable to sustain it. And he's here encouraged to know that there are others with him that are accomplishing the ministry alongside him. Some that are also, by, in, his, in his understanding, also saved Jews. <coughs> Pardon me. I'm, I'm like Bruce. I'm dealing with leftover sickness. So bear with me as I get through this and if I, my voice cracks a little bit. So... Here, Paul is comforted by this fact. It inherently gives him comfort and encouragement to know that he's not the only saved Jewish believer in Christ, that he has other people like him doing this alongside him in the ministry. That's a comfort for him. Encouragement and support from one fallible human being to another matters. I'll read that one more time. Encouragement and support from one fallible human being to another does matter. Paul shows that here. He needed that. We also know this because... We also realize that Paul, especially towards the end of his ministry, was not in good relationships with a lot of Jews at all. He'd had, if you look at the book of Acts, you'll see he had lots of run-ins with arrogant Jews or the Judaizers that opposed him vehemently. He was largely an enemy of his own people on their terms or as they considered it. You can look at Acts 14, uh, 1 through 3. You can look at Acts 17, 5. You can look notably at Acts 18, 5 and 6, which is where Paul simply says, and he preaches to the Jews, and they reject him, and he says, I'm done. I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm shaking the dust off my feet, and I'm going to the Gentiles. I'm leaving. So he parts ways dramatically with his own people. You can imagine, especially as a previous Jew and one who was a very Jewish Jew, one who was extremely uh, pharisaical in his Jewish nature, that now he's completely cut off from his own people. He's completely distanced from them, and is in fact their enemy by their standards. They are the reason that he's in prison right now. That 
That is a massive discouragement to him. That's a massive depression to him. Imagine being completely cut off from your own people that despise you because you changed beliefs, and now you're in prison because of it. So here this is a comfort to Paul to know that he is not alone in that, that there are others like him. The ministry to the Jews is not in vain, that there are, as we understand in Romans 9, the Israel within Israel, so to speak. There is a true spiritual Israel that does hear the gospel, that does repent. And we understand that as uh, Romans 9 and 10 make clear. There's a section of those Jewish people that make up the true spiritual Israel, and Paul sees that here. Paul can understand that here. He recognizes there's some here, and that brings him encouragement. That brings him encouragement and comfort to know that in his imprisonment. So let this be another reminder of us of how important it is that we preserve one another, that we sustain one another, that we encourage one another, especially when it's difficult and discouraging in the midst of trying to glorify God on this earth. And then finally, what I really want to get to is Epaphras. So, verses 12 and 13. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, he greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers. What an interesting statement. That you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and in Heropolis. So, I realize I'm moving pretty fast through these. I'm doing another one of my, I guess, scattershot sermons where I just go through a ton of people really quick. But if we get nothing else from this, I want us to get what's happening with Epaphras because there's a few things that are critical here to our understanding, not only of how we're supposed to live, but also the Colossian book as a whole. Here's, the letter is really culminated in a lot of ways right here with Epaphras. So, for those that were here in the beginning, we remember the story of Epaphras. Epaphras is really the reason for this letter He's the originator of this letter. You can look at uh, chapter 1, verse 7 of Colossians and see him also mentioned there in that text. What we understand about Epaphras historically is that Paul never went to Colossae. He never was in Colossae that we know of. There's other scripture that shows that he says that I never saw their faces. I've never seen you guys' faces, i.e. I've never been there. But at some point in his ministry, Paul ran into Epaphras. Epaphras was away from Colossae for whatever reason. Uh, he, ran, he runs to Paul, he hears the gospel, he's saved by the gospel, and then he returns to his home city and preaches and builds essentially a church by the grace of God in that city. So he come, returns, he comes back to his home church or his hometown, he uh, preaches the gospel, a church is made, and they start growing up. And as we see the story unfold, problems arise. So it goes great. Paul says in the beginning of chapter 1, he says, I'm glad you understand the basic things like the gospel and faith and hope and love. That's great, but there's some problems arising. Uh, specifically in chapter 2 of Colossians, there's a false doctrines that are rising up. There's asceticism, the belief that if you punish yourself, if you hurt yourself enough, that God will be pleased with you. If you uh, there's Gnosticism, the idea that uh, you can ascend to the higher plane of understanding God, that if we uh, go to the next spiritual level, on some level, we'll be closer to God by some means. Uh, all these beliefs started filtering into the church. And Epaphras realizes this, and Epaphras realizes it's a problem. So what does he do? He goes to Paul personally, and he tells Paul, he says, I've got these problems, help me. And to that end, the book of Colossians is written. So that's the whole premise of the book, is Epaphras seeing that there's issues and he is a figure that's key and critical to understanding the book of Colossians. He's the original requester for help, if you will. He was the first one that says, hey, I need some help over here. <clears throat> you can see this also in Colossians 1.7, that he's there. And very interestingly, just as a side note, his, the only other place his name appears is Philemon. Philemon, verse 23. More evidence on the scale of they were both close by. So we, but we can note a couple things about Epaphras here. Specifically that it says he's struggling on your behalf in his prayers. What does that mean? What does it mean to struggle in your prayers in that regard? How does one struggle when they pray? Well, the Greek word here, if we look at the Greek text, uh, this is the Greek word to struggle. It's the word agonizomai, where we get our word agonize from, to agonize over. And it simply means that, very simply, to, to exert great effort to push forward with determination and hardship. It was used to describe the athletes that competed in the Greek games, that they struggled, they ran, they uh, were very dedicated, they put a lot of heart and effort and work into accomplishing their goal. That's the idea. You struggle to great extent. So here, quite simply, it means in the context that 
Epaphras put a great deal of time, a great deal of effort, a great deal of heart went into Epaphras' prayers. It was something very important and critical to him. This is a praying man, if ever there was one. This is a man who is very much in prayer for his church. It is something of great importance to him, so much so that he is putting that much effort into it, that he is struggling on their behalf to pray. This principle that we see here of prayer is reminiscent of Luke 18, 1 through 8, just as a reference. In Luke 18, 1 through 8 is the parable of Christ, of the unjust judge. Uh, the, the story essentially goes where there's an unjust judge and a widow comes to him and it bugs him and bugs him and bugs him. And eventually the judge says, fine, I'll give you what you want if you'll go away. And the story is essentially that how much more God gives good gifts to his children. Heed what the unjust judge said. Because if she wore me down, I gave her what she wants. So when essentially the message of the parable is pray to God. Be a praying person. Pray fervently. How much is God going to grant what is good to you, what is truly good, don't misunderstand me, to those who are his children? If the, God listens to the sincere and heartfelt and continuous requests of his servants. Another major theme of chapter 4 has been prayer. We've seen that. We've looked at verses 1 and 2, uh, that, or 2 and 3, excuse me, to pray. This consistent basis, pray for uh, evangelism, to pray for the ability and the opportunity to evangelize. And here you see an example of a praying man who is so concerned about the well-being of his people, of his brothers and sisters in Christ, that it's described as a struggle to him. It is that important to him. So, this can kind of be a something MacArthur I heard many, many years ago on a sermon where he said it can be a kind of a trap of Reformed theology to think that we should not struggle and fervently pray. Because it's all been predestined. That's kind of one of the arguments that they bring against us, right? That, well, if it's all been predestined, it's all sovereign, then it really doesn't matter. I can just go home and sit on the couch. We know that's wrong because the Reformed theology doesn't dismiss the fact that God uses our prayers as a means of bringing about his predestined will. We are the instruments that bring it about. Yes, he could just override us. He could just do it without any of us. But he is sovereignly ordained in his infinite wisdom that we are to be the instruments that bring about his will. God does act on behalf of his servants when they pray. And here we see an example of Epaphras praying for the Colossians. We've recently discussed a lot of prayer, but specifically, what does he pray for here? He prays for two things. I'm going to just look at one this week. He prays that you may stand mature, as your first one, and fully assured in all the will of God. So you have two requests from Epaphras to God. Pray that the Colossians are mature and pray that they are fully assured in the will of God. The fact that he prays that they stand mature, when we understand this and we understand the book of Colossians as we come to the end here, this is a fantastic culmination of the purpose of this book. And what I'm going to talk about next week, if there's really one idea that summarizes the book of Colossians, one general purpose of this book. If there's one thing that you could summarize the entire book under, what the purpose of the book is, it's maturity. Christian maturity. Spiritual maturity. This whole book was written by Paul to people that he believed were, that he said were saved, but had some immaturity issues. We can just look briefly back a couple chapters at uh, chapter 2, verses 16 and 18, and see some other problems. Back there in verse 2.16, he says, Let but no one pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink, or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. <clears throat> Excuse me. These are a shadow of things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and the worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind. Here is a great example of an immature believer right here. Someone who is saved, someone who is a gospel-believing person, but someone who's getting involved in immaturity, someone who's getting tied up on extra-biblical issues that have nothing to do with the advancement of the kingdom of God. They're tied up instead with how we should observe the calendar, how we should, am I observing the Sabbath correctly? Am I abiding by all the technical Sabbath rules? Am I abiding by the correct holidays or not the correct holidays? Am I... Where should, maybe I should uh, be an ascetic. I should beat myself with chains or I should damage my body in such a way and that was going to please God somehow. Or uh, maybe we should worship the angels. Maybe uh, by praising and 
giving thanks to other great spiritual beings that we will somehow glorify God. Or, you know, even worse, he says they go on in detail about visions. So here's uh, something our more charismatic brothers may remember, something that uh, going on with these extra biblical revelation. Oh, I got some visions. I got some dreams. I got some new news. And they're being puffed up without reason. So these are people who are not concerned about maturity and godliness and the growth of the body, but they're instead worried about observing all these immature issues. That's what Paul writes this entire letter to address. And Epaphras prays for the opposite effect, that the body grows in maturity, that they learn based on their basic principles of the faith. If you remember back when we preached through chapter 1, Paul's essential message is, I'm glad and I'm thankful that you know the gospel. I'm glad that you understand faith and hope and love and Christ. That's great. But now I want you to add to that understanding. I want you to add to that wisdom. I want you to add to those things discernment. I want you to press on to the next level. I want you to increase and improve. You have farther yet to go. Maturity is the theme of this book. It means putting aside these extra-biblical issues that are described in chapter 2, putting off these old fleshly ways, as chapter 3 is, uh, and chapter 3 makes very clear, putting aside the evil, putting aside the wrong, putting aside being focused on this earth, you can see in the beginning of chapter 3, instead focusing on heavenly things. If you want to see a description of what maturity is, so we say, okay, so we know this is immature, we know... Uh, visions and worship of angels and asceticism, that's all immaturity. What is maturity? Chapter 3 is the solution to that. He says, here's what maturity looks like. It looks like putting away slander and malice and wrong thinking and all these things. And he says, it's putting on all these personal virtues. It's putting on faith and hope and love. And it's uh, being a good husband. It's being a good wife. It's being a good parent or child or slave or master and a living in a respectful, Christ-like, honoring way in those regards. That's maturity. So that's the maturity that Epaphras prays the Colossians to have. And that's the kind of maturity we have to seek as believers in Christ. So if nothing else, I want us to take this from Epaphras' example. Epaphras is focused on the real issue. Epaphras understands the seriousness of praying for the maturity of the body of Christ. I preached before on uh, verses 2 and 3 that uh, these are great prayer requests to have. Pray for the opportunity and the ability to witness, to evangelize. Here, Epaphras gives us another demonstration of what we can pray for. Pray for the maturity of the body. This church and all churches as a whole, just entirety. If in fact, we can argue that if there's any one thing modern evangelic evangelicals need, it's maturity, isn't it? There's a lot of them that know the gospel. There are. There's a very few of them that are mature. <clears throat> so this is something that we can easily pray for. Pray for the church at large to grow in maturity and in godliness. And then... Finishing out Epaphras here in verse 13. And Paul leaves us with this final discussion of him. For I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and in Heropolis. So Paul has one more thing to say about this guy. He gives him essentially a, a testimony of his labors. He says, I know and I can tell you, I can bear witness. He's worked very hard on your behalf. He has put forth a great deal of effort. He not only struggles in his prayers, but notice the past tense here. He has worked hard for you previously, even putting aside his prayer. So not only does he pray, not only is he struggling for their maturity in his prayers, but in addition to those things, he demonstrates a great deal of work on behalf of those churches. And we say, what work? What has he done? Is there any way we can see that? Well, the only thing that we know of immediately uh, that we know that Epaphras did, and he worked hard on behalf of the body of Christ, was not only in planting a church, not only in building up a body of believers, but when he saw it was struggling, when he saw there was a problem, when he saw there was an issue, he goes all the way to Rome to solve the problem. This is a man who, remember, this is the Roman Empire. You walked if you wanted to get anywhere, unless you were really rich, and then you rode a horseback, and it wasn't a whole lot better. But in those cases, you walked all the way. So this man sees problems in his church. He sees that there's immaturity rising up, and he goes all the way to Rome. Colossae, for reference, is somewhere in um, modern-day Turkey. It's Asia Minor. It'd be somewhere in central Turkey. He travels all the way to Italy, Rome, because it is that important to him. It is that critical to him 
that this church survive, this church be a mature church in the word of Christ. So we know that Epaphras has greatly worked and been very diligent in the ministry on behalf of the Colossian church. And this is just one example of his work that we know of. He was willing to journey all the way to Apostle Paul and say, help me, we need help. There's a problem and I need you to help me solve it. So this would have been a months long journey in that day and age, but it was not too big for Epaphras to do. And Paul understands that. Paul praises him for that. And Paul uh, understands that not only in his prayers, but also in his efforts, that Epaphras is a model that we can aspire towards in that regard. So if nothing else, today I want us to learn from Epaphras. I know last week was Tychicus. Here it's Epaphras. We can be someone like Epaphras. We can pray for the maturity of the body. And we can also be willing to sacrifice to make sure brothers and sisters in Christ are truly being taken care of, are truly being built up in the faith as they should be, according to the word of God, not according to immature, extra-biblical stuff. It matters that much to Epaphras. So I'm going to close and say that we need to model the life of Epaphras. He's a demonstration of a good brother in Christ. So let's be a people that pray with real effort for the sincerity of the maturity of the well-being of the believers in Christ. And let's also be a people that realize that the work we do matters. The work we do that matters eternally is that critical. It was not too much for Epaphras to walk months to go to Rome to take care of his brothers and sisters in Christ. It's that important to him. So let's be a people that realize the sacrificial work of the gospel is that critical. It's something we should pray for, and it's something that we should model Epaphras in. So let's be a people willing to pray for maturity in Christ, and let's be a people willing to sacrifice for the gospel and the word of God and the maturity of the church. Let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Father, we want to come before you. We want to thank you for all that you've given us. We want to thank you for your word that you've delivered to us that we can learn from these examples of faithful men. And I pray, Lord, that you would make us a mature body of believers in Christ, that there is always more Christ-likeness to pursue. There's always more sanctification we must struggle towards. And I pray you would continue to make us mature in Christ, that we would be built up and be more sanctified on a daily basis. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.